All right, where was I? Oh yeah, I just finished explaining the Matum, AKA the most revolutionary thing this world has ever seen. Right, okay. I reached out to Mools and he came up with a way to help increase both the productivity and quality of my artistic output. Of course, the story doesn't stop there. It starts there. After a couple of months under the Matum, I was ready to start releasing music again. Which brings us here. My song, Garden, the first Matum product that the world ever heard. I suppose I get to explain a bit about it for the first time ever. I'd recorded a bunch of stuff between April, the start of the Matum, and July, the month I released Garden. Most of it rap, which makes sense because that's what I was doing at the time. It was the only thing I was doing at the time. This was a rap operation. But things would change in the most drastic way. I mean, what other word could be used to describe a pretty much 180 degree pivot away from rap into what I create now? It all started when Moles found and sent me the beat for it. Like I said, we had no intention at all of making songs where I wasn't rapping, but during the week I had the beat, I found myself humming melodies, not potential rap cadences. It just felt like the right thing to do. So I took a chance. Drawing from an experience involving someone I had a crush on for verses one and three, and an experience with an ex for verse two, I wrote some uncharacteristically non-rap verses and sang my heart out. I didn't know what to expect when I sent it back to Moles at the end of the week, but luckily he hashtag saw the vision. Funnily enough, he pointed out later that the sample on the beat, David McCollum's The Edge, was one that had been used plenty of times in rap songs, perhaps most recognizably in Dr. Dre's The Next Episode. So that made me taking things in a different direction extra satisfying. Still, at the time when it was done, we just thought it'd be a cool change of pace. The one outlier on an otherwise completely rap album soon find out in a few months that I'd actually set my exit from rap into motion. More on how that decision was officially made when I discuss McFly next episode. But let's just end with the question everyone has been asking. And by everyone, I mean absolutely no one. Just who are the crush and the ex that I was singing about on guard? Well, out of respect for the ex, I won't be answering that part. Besides, she's probably somewhere in Albuquerque, living in a big turquoise house, not concerned with me and all the smiling I do for the camera these days. The best course of action she could have taken after dealing with me, honestly. But the crush? Maybe it was someone from school back in the day. Maybe I'm lying and it was about no one. Or maybe, just maybe, Verses 1 and 3 were part of a fictitious story I built for the sake of the song, but inspired by the girl that worked at the Sonic on 745 West Highway 50 in O'Fallon, Illinois in May of 2016, around the time I wrote it, and based on an interaction with her that happened the same day I met LJ and Alicia, fantastic friends and beautiful people, for the first time IRL because we were all at the Sonic waiting on the slushes parked at one of the drive-in spots, somewhere around here actually, and I didn't see her approaching the vehicle as I was being wild animated while telling LJ and Alicia something, most likely embarrassing myself with her slight smirk was any indication when I finally noticed she was standing outside of the car. And maybe I've been hoping that the song would one day get very popular, she'd hear it, love it, and by chance be watching some interview where I explain the story behind it, the story you may have just heard, put two and two together and we'd get married like some sort of Disney movie. Or, you know, maybe it was the high school thing. Eh, 